Um, let's start off like just when, when you put your book out, how did you expect people to respond to it? When we put the book out, we put it out for the Congressional Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, and it wasn't meant for the mainstream public. We had hoped that by um, taking the information to Congress that we'd be able to bring about some changes that way, overcome the 1947 National Security Act. When that didn't happen, it did start going hand, hand to hand to different people throughout the country, and it was never publicized properly. So I never really anticipated any kind of a, a response because I knew it was pretty much out of the uh, realm of most people's um, point of reference. A lot of people didn't have a point of reference for it, especially back in 1995. A lot more have a point of reference for it today. But So I, I never really anticipated a response and I certainly didn't expect a, um, a warm one. Can you just talk about the criminal environment you were living in your father was selling to and how he supplemented the family income? My, my father supplemented the family income with the proceeds from child pornography, which was being sold through the local Michigan Mafia child pornography ring. It was well established and was being sanctioned by a criminal faction of the government that was, trying, was targeting children like myself for mind control. The dissociative disorder that I suffered from was something that any child that was being used in pornography would have and is a strong basis for mind control. Did, do you think your parents, I mean obviously later you really were into a high tech realm of programming. Do you think your parents had any idea that they were in fact programming you for something? They, they did when my father sold me into MK Ultra. He was, he was aware on all levels of what it was about and exactly what it was for, what it would entail. And he would say, even way back then, he'd say things like, spies are made, not born. And so he knew that I would have to be made. And he'd been taught how to raise me in the project according to conditioning me with childhood themes and um, continuing abuse and taking me to certain places according to the instructions of the political people that were directing his actions. How did your life change once you became part of the program? Once I became part of the program, my free thought began eroding more and more at a pretty rapid rate through extreme traumas like occult trauma. Well, talk about in your own way how you interpret the clinical effect of, of trauma on the brain. When trauma occurs, the the brain actually compartmentalizes the memory of the event so the rest of the mind can function normally. and since the dissociative disorder is defined as the mind's sane defense to trauma too horrible to comprehend, the occultism was certainly too horrible to comprehend, as was the, the incest and the sexual abuse. So it was actually creating more compartments in my mind, and the more compartments that were created, the less of, of me there was. And then pretty soon I was just operating with no conscious awareness of what had happened before, what was going to happen, and I began living only in the moment and operating on a subconscious level, which left me um, highly suggestible to where I would do exactly what I was told to do rather than think to go do something on my own. You know, dad had a sixth grade education. He wasn't incredibly intelligent. Was he able to control all these compartments? My father didn't, didn't have to control the, all the compartments in my brain. He would take me to Mackinac Island, Michigan, which is where the, the Michigan Governor's Mansion is located, and that was one area where I was subjected to a more high-tech level of mind manipulation and where I eventually met who would be my owner in MK Ultra Mind Control, U.S. Senator Robert C. Byrd. Once Senator Byrd became my owner, he directed my programming to be on a much more sophisticated level to um, U.S. military bases and NASA installations throughout the United States. How has your father benefited from this program? When, when my father was first approached by Gerald Ford, he was earning his living as a worm digger and he had a sixth grade education and he wasn't he wasn't a real intelligent or ambitious type person and he didn't have the kind of drive and self-esteem that would take him any further except for the fact that by the time I was 13 and Senator Byrd became my owner in MKUltra, Senator Byrd has had a 
was head of U.S. Senate appropriations for many, many years, and he decided where money would be appropriated, and when my father sold me into the project, he received lucrative military contracts that worked in a, um, a parts manufacturing camshafts for military vehicles, and ultimately made him extremely wealthy um, just because of, of selling his children into the project. You talk about um, Robert T. Byrd becoming your owner. Uh, when was the first time that you were told of this? Well, I, I knew that Senator Byrd was my owner, like the first time that I was with him, I knew that he would be my owner. I didn't think of him so much as an owner, as someone who was directing my activities from that point. He would decide where I would be taken and when, who would be my handlers. Of course, my father was my handler until I became of legal age. At 18, my handler was Wayne Cox, as appointed by Senator Byrd. Senator Byrd wanted Wayne Cox to be my handler because he was already involved in government operations, especially where mercenaries were concerned, where the CIA um, covert operations were concerned, and he was also a part of an extreme trauma base. Senator Byrd wanted more compartments created in my mind through this, the severity of the trauma that I did experience with Wayne Cox. Let's talk about, about going in Washington, and how, where would you meet Byrd, and how would he talk to you? Is it different than a normal person? Well, Senator Byrd never talked to me like like a friend or someone that he, he, he talked to me more like an object or a possession or, or a, a chess piece to be moved around in a game wherever he decided. An example of how I would get to Washington, D.C. would be that my next handler and, and final handler in MK Ultra Mind Control was Alex Houston. Alex Houston is a ventriloquist stage hypnotist in the country music industry. The country music industry made a, provided a cover or a means of traveling um, to the various military NASA installations and in and out of the Caribbean across the United States and into Washington, D.C. How was Houston's identity in the country music scene used to facilitate your role in the program? When Alex Houston would be booked into certain areas, they were always done according to the different operations that I would be used in and right close to the vicinity so that I would be sure to be available for whatever um, operations or perversions I was, I was going to be used in. For example, going into Washington, D.C., then I would be taken to the Smithsonian Institute and would stand in a strategic place where I was supposed to meet whoever my contact was that would escort me into the White House. So whether it be Park Service or Secret Service, somebody would come over and, and get me to take me into the White House. And I would stand at the, like the Wizard of Oz, um, Ruby Slippers and the Witch's Hat. Or they had this face changing booth in there that was also a part of programming. Whatever was already attached to my programming, it would already, when I saw it, it would trigger me into a trance. So I'd be standing there in trance when the, when my contacts would come to take me into the White House. We'd go ac across the, the mall or the lawn, the, the park, whatever term you want to call it over to the White House, go in the service entrance of the White House that um, was, was kind of around the side and said service entrance on it meant serve us in trance to me. You write extensively about your visits to Reagan after being prostituted by Byrd. Can you explain how that got started? Senator Byrd wanted to have like, like a closer association with Ronald Reagan, so I was brought into a White House party and Ronald, I met Ronald Reagan. While he was while he was president, and I was to be used in in different operations. So Ronald Reagan already knew that I would be used that way, but also knew that I had been used in pornography, which he was very much interested in, and was was very interested in the use of pornography on a covert level, where it would actually compromise certain government leaders. There's different tools they would use, obviously, when they're in mind control. What's one of the, I mean, there's obviously codes, keys, and triggers, but is there other forms of, of tools that are used commonly in mind control? 
Stun guns were the most commonly used form of trauma for mind control, and it was a tool that could be used outside of the major programming centers to um, drop me, to transport me into different places, to compartmentalize memory. It was used by various escorts. Uh, my handler, predominantly Alex Houston, used a stun gun all the time. It was used by um, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino of the Psychological Warfare Division, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and he was the founder of the Occult Templar Set. We'll go into that separately. What, what, what's, uh, what, what kind of effect is long-term effects to do the stun guns leave on people? The stun guns result in a weakening of the skin where they where they hit, and it creates either moles eventually will rise up from it, or there will be um, little white holes that never really tan, and there's red spots that come from it. If, if, if you were walking on the street or looking at seeing porn magazines, would you be able to identify people who had prod marks? I mean before harmonics were used so strongly, the prod marks were, were heavily used to the point where ever the stun gun prod marks would be raised up on a person and strategic places would be indicative of the form of operation that they were to be used in. For example, the, the ones that were located on the left side of the face was usually indicative of some kind of message delivery or um, a, a photographic recording that could be going on by the, by the program person. The ones on the throat were indicative of, of sex programming, oral sex programming. The different places where they were located were clear indicators to people in the know what kind of mode of operation I was working in. What would you say was the most traumatic thing you endured during your exposure to the mind control program? The, the most traumatic thing that I ever, ever endured was um, not being able to protect my daughter. And it was always a trauma base for me. It was an extreme trauma base because it went against my maternal instincts. Everything that I had hoped for as a child, everything that I, I am inside to want to love her and protect her and take good care of her and give her a, a wonderful and safe environment. And I couldn't do that. I couldn't think to do that. What was the nature of Kelly's exposure to the project? Kelly was born into the project on a level where she was subjected to high-tech uh, mind control programming on a harmonic level, literally from birth. In the book, you describe Kelly as having an abnormally high level of intelligence for her age. How did her programming differ from yours? I developed compartmentalization from trauma. She developed it from the harmonics, which actually vibrates the neuron pathways instead of having the trauma create the compartmentalization. So. Since she had that so early on, she was also receptive to anything that was put in there and would photographically remember it when triggered open. And that would include this incredible vocabulary that she had at such an early age. So where would this high-tech programming take place? Fort Campbell, Kentucky was another place where she was exposed to the most sophisticated levels of mind control programming. They had all the equipment and capability already established there for military special forces. It's where the 101st Airborne is trained and it's where she was being uh, programmed just right after birth because we'd already been transferred to Nashville by that time. When Mark was freeing you, freeing your mind, how did it start to occur? Like, Did, did memories just start flying out of your head? What was it like? When Mark first rescued Kelly and I, he took us to um, the safety and serenity of Alaska, which it was so peaceful and so beautiful. We weren't being abused. We were safe for the first time. We knew love. And as a result, it's a natural phenomenon that the, the, that a person would begin to remember little bits and pieces. Besides, we were in extreme danger. We had a lot of... Of, of problems. Mark's bank accounts had been cleared out. We'd had received a lot of threats because of something that I couldn't remember. As a matter of fact, I, I became aware that I didn't know what had happened to over 10 years of my life at all. I had no recollection at all, totally amnesic. I even thought I was still um, 24 years old when I was actually 30 years old. So um, 
those things all lent to the very beginning of beginning to remember. And as I began to remember, Mark taught me a method that was very effective to recall what's incomprehensible. Since the disorder that I had was resulting from trauma too horrible to comprehend, it had to be made comprehensible in order to take those walls down in my mind and take the compartmentalization down. So in order for it to be comprehensible, the best way was to deal with it logically. Emotionally, there's no place for the kind of horror that my daughter and I experienced and that but logically, I began to understand, and the logic was accessed by writing out my memories. The, when a, a person moves a pen, the logic portion of their brain is what actually controls the pen, so automatically the memory is shifted over to logic and, and comes out on paper, and it's a very, um, very safe and, and easy way of being able to, to remember what was actually photographically recorded. How did Kelly respond to Mark? She loved Mark very, very much. She still loves Mark very, very much. She felt safe with him. He wasn't abusing her. He was obviously loving. The animals loved him, and that had a profound effect on her as well. Kelly has a, a strong love for animals, and since we couldn't think, we could our senses were heightened like like a blind person's hearing is is accentuated our senses were heightened to where we had senses like an animal and knew that that he was good and the animals loved him and it was just um it had a profound effect on kelly she knew that goodness did exist in the world that that animals could be safe in places that love was was available and that has has given her a lot of hope for um, returning to a normal life once she receives her last bit of um, technological rehabilitation that she so desperately needs.